go to Robert Contreras. Gracias, Jose. Uh, buenos dias y buenas tardes. Uh, today, I, I will be presenting on the challenges and barriers that COVID-19 created for Bienestar in providing our services uh, and how we adapted a new approach on how to serve the community uh, at the same time mitigating the risks of staff, uh, staff and clients. I will briefly touch on the population we serve. We need to change the, uh, the, the need to change the services that we provide, the agencies, barriers and challenges, community member uh, challenges, adapting new services, delivery and approach, uh, approach and preparation for reopening. First, um, I want to share that Bienestar provides services out of our six centers throughout uh, Los Angeles County and serve pop, pop, a population that had been historically marginalized, underserved, and consequently made vulnerable to poor health outcomes, discrimination, racism, and the lack of economic and social justice guarantees. COVID-19 has brought these deficiencies to the forefront, showing that Latinx and African Americans are the most affected by it. Um, after 31 years, the agency was already exploring new ways of uh, re, uh, doing outreach to a population uh, of gay, MSM, transgender women, and social users to keep up with changes in how they access information and how they connect it socially. The onset of COVID-19 uh, pushed push us to implement these changes sooner than what we anticipated. Also, um, due to the state at home order, we got our managers uh, to work together to discuss which services we will continue to provide in person, which centers would remain open with modified hours, and which services would be provided remotely, and which centers would be closed. We also engaged our community advisory board to help us, help us how to notify the community on the changes in services. During this, during this transition, uh, barriers and challenges arose. Uh, some of these are were um, how to address the request for HIV, STI, and HIV, uh, HIV screening, how to continue to roll out group level interventions that we were uh, contracted to implement, such as 3MB, healthy relationship, Hermanos de Lunisol, how to preserve the personal connection that clients have become accustomed of receiving as they met with their counselors, health educators, and peer specialists. The stay-at-home orders require us to cancel our community mobile testing and outreaches, which were normally conducted where the target population congregates. Nightclubs, adult schools, universities, parks, and other venues were ordered to close. Uh, this limited us where to conduct an outreach and engage the community. Uh, another challenge was collecting clients' assessments, consent forms, and documents uh, required by the founders to meet eligibility criteria. But as I mentioned, it was not just being a start facing challenges. Uh, clients also were experiencing challenges, such as the lack of trust, um, lack of knowledge and trust of access to telehealth and received services we had to prepare clients. Some were not perceptive to telehealth at the beginning. Some clients had difficulty accessing telehealth services due to limitation with their internet capability, not having a phone or laptop with video camera, poor phone connection or reception, or running out of battery. The major barrier clients encounter was privacy. Clients have had difficulty in being able to find a safe space to have a session and maintain confidentiality while while at their home because of their living, uh, they were living with several people. Another common reason for clients falling out of care was due to them actually acquiring COVID-19 or having unstable housing. Working as a team, uh, these barriers were seen more as challenges that we can overcome in order to serve our community. So Bienestar continued to deliver some essential services using the grab and go modality. Our food bank and syringe exchange services prepare bags that clients could come into the center and pick up. For HIV, HCV and STI screening, we utilize electronic health records data to create a timeline for testing. Uh, this allowed us to reach out to clients who 
who had not been tested in the last three months to come in to get tested once testing resumed at our agency. We will have our testers call clients every three months to remind them to come in for testing. We also secured Zoom for healthcare telehealth accounts and provided training to staff and peer counselors in order for them to conduct workshops, group level intervention, and social engagement activities. We also disseminated through our social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter information on how to participate in Zoom and, tele and telehealth activity. Having acquired the Zoom telehealth technology allowed our staff who were now working remotely to conduct activities as a team so that clients enrolling in the group intervention had two or three being study health educators leading the discussion and curriculum. This, secu this secure additional support for the participants. We also found that Zoom telehealth was beneficial in delivering individual sessions. We have faced challenges such as clients having trouble connecting or using the app. However, as participants became familiar with the modality of receiving services, they became comfortable receiving services through the medium. Due to this success, we are looking to continue to render Zoom consulting with, which will assist in the lack of follow-up or client's barrier to, of transportation to complete one-on-one -on -one sessions. We hope that Zoom chats will address people dropping out. During this pandemic, we also uh, attempted to, to continue with close support group via Zoom, as uh, we had before, before COVID-19, but, but it did not work as expected. Participated, participation started to decline almost immediately. However, the members of the different groups started participating in our new online groups that we call Happy Hour, the Ambiente Men Chat Groups, and the Transgender Women Chats on Wednesdays. Uh, these Facebook groups provided a space for us to have healthy dialogues. They appear to reach a larger audience. We plan to continue doing this post reopening and using this to recruit and engage new participants. Our goal is to expand the use of Zoom to serve current clients and access new participants that have found us, on, found us online. Social media can be a tool to meet contractual obligations, recruitment, engagement, and showcasing of being a start programming. The staff have worked with clients to explain the benefits of telehealth and the need to conduct remote sessions for safety uh, reasons related to COVID-19. We offer both video and phone sessions for those that do not have a phone with video. This relationship has allowed staff to express to a client the importance of continuing to address the treatment goal during telehealth phone sessions. A staff communicate with clients to remind them of the upcoming appointment to ensure that they are available for phone or telehealth sessions. A staff is flexible in rescheduling if a client is unable to participate during the original session time. As I had mentioned earlier, most clients live in, in houses environments where confidential is limited. Uh, staff address concerns with clients in being able to maintain confidentiality while conducting sessions in their home. Staff explore where the client felt safe and comfortable during the session time. If no place was available within the home due to limited space or other individuals in the home, then staff work with the clients to find alternative options, such as uh, taking the call uh, inside their car or, go, or finding a space outside the, the home to take the call. To acquire the, the required eligibility and documentation, staff communicated with referring parties to obtain needed documentation, such as IDs, insurance information, and other paperwork, if they had it available, or have the client email picture of the documentation via secure email. The study is currently preparing to reopen all the centers providing comprehensive services. We have prepared and implemented protocols that have at its core as a score mission to mitigate infection of COVID-19. We have been able to secure PPE, not only for our staff, but for any client that may need, that may need it. Our protocol provides procedures as to what minimal requirements staff and clients must meet in order to gain access to the centers and how to provide face-to-face -face services. We are committed to creating an environment where people can disclose potential exposure and infection, not to create stigma. Finally, um, I want to emphasize that I've been discussing the immediate challenges and solutions encountered by clients 
and the organization during the COVID-19 stay-at-home orders. But I do want all of us to keep in mind that vulnerable and marginalized communities do not enjoy justice and equality needed to have genuine health outcomes. This is a stark reality is only highlighted by the current experience of police brutality due to racism, and we must all continue our goal to ensure justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for sharing uh, some of how uh, the staff um, have been flexible in, in your local community, uh, adapting to these telehealth needs and for bring, raising that final point as well. Um, and with that, um, we'd like to turn it to Bambi um, to share a little bit more about her perspective and what she's seeing on the ground. So Bambi, the floor is yours. Um. Thank you. Gracias. Um, bueno, primero que nada, quiero darle gracias a mi poder superior por de un día más de existencia. Y también quiero uh, pues honrar la presencia de todas las personas que nos acompañan hoy en día. Este, esperando que pues todos estén um, pues haciendo lo mejor posible para cuidarse y este cuidar a las personas que quieren en estos tiempos tan difíciles para todas las personas. Um, hi everybody, uh, Bambi Salcedo with Trans Latina Coalition. I, you know, I always like to honor my higher power for giving me the opportunity to be here with all of you, but I also wanted to honor the presence of all of you in this uh, modality for us to learn about one another and figure out ways for us to obviously see how we can um, continue to provide services to those who are the most marginalized within our own communities. Um, thank you so much, uh, the Latino Commission on AIDS and everyone the planning committee of these sessions for giving me the opportunity to be part of this session and really highlight the specific, uh, obviously needs, issues and challenges and opportunities that we as an organization have encountered throughout um, not just this horrible pandemic, but the current situation that we are experiencing, right? Trying to also figure out ways uh, for us to support the leadership of our Black siblings. Um, by the way, those of you who are uh, Afro-Latinx identified, also sending you love and appreciation for who you are and your existence in this world. I definitely want to let you know that uh, we as a small nonprofit translator organization have um, obviously been faced with many different challenges. Um, we never thought in a million years that we were going to experience a global pandemic um, that was going to affect the way that, ha that this pandemic has affected our community. Um, obviously, with the support and guidance of many different individuals who have been doing this work and have led uh, other uh, organizations, um, we were able to adapt and uh, adapt some things um, at our organization. But one of the first things that I do want to let everyone know is that we as an organization made the decision not to close our doors, uh, but really figuring out how we were going to continue to support uh, our community, even, even if it was just a um, hot plate of food, um, which is something that we have been doing since we opened our doors. Um, and so we as an organization uh, decided at the very beginning of this uh, pandemic or actually when everything hit and everybody, you know, was orders to stay home, um, we gave um, our staff the option to stay home and work from home. Um, but through that, we also encountered different things, right? Um, one, um, we don't have electronic, uh, I guess, record system at our organization, which meant that um, those case managers who decided to work from home uh, needed to come to the office also 
to access clients' uh, phone numbers, for instance, for them to do follow-ups uh, or you know, continue to uh, keep people engaged. So that was one of the things. Um, nonetheless, we, again, we continue to have our doors open um, and we were alternating, you know, those who wanted to come into the office and have access to information um, and those of us who were going to stay behind and provide immediate support to those who need it. Um, since the pandemic hit, uh, our uh, calls to our organization have increased up to 500%, uh, primarily from trans people who um, obviously, who are scared of, you know, becoming homeless, those who did have the privilege to have employment and those who have the privilege to have a place to stay, um, really calling in fear of, um, you know, losing their place, uh, those who have uh, lost their employment. Um, obviously, you know, the majority of people who have, uh, who are trans and who have employment are individuals who work in the service industry. Um, like, you know, the majority um, work either in doing uh, impersonations at bars or clubs. Um, the many work also in, um, beauty salons and the beauty industry. Many also work, you know, cleaning at um, buildings uh, and restaurants. So, you know, many of us, many members of our community were calling just to see how we can support them. Um, and through those efforts, uh, we have been able to reach out to, to different foundations. Um, you know, we right now have a campaign uh, to invest in trans lives, um, which, you know, we are obviously holding not just the government sector, but also the private sector accountable for the investment that they're um, putting into trans lives. Um, so one of the initiatives that we're doing here in the state of California is that we are, um, we are uh, responding to the governor's budget. And again, this was sort of like um, pre-COVID-19 and then after COVID-19 hit, um, our, you know, like our approach to this is uh, really letting the, govern the governor know and our legislators that COVID-19 is a perfect example why trans people uh, need services, specific services, right? Uh, so we are, um, we are, um, we want our government to intentionally invest in trans, uh, in trans led organizations, but also trans people as a whole, right? Um, so we currently have a bill uh, in place that it's um, Assembly Bill 2218, which is the Transgender Health and Equity Funds, in which um, we are, um, we're working with Assembly Member Santiago to ensure that um, there's a bill that addresses the holistic needs, the holistic health needs of trans uh, people across the state. Um, so in total, we're asking our governor um, for $100 million to be allocated specifically to trans-led groups and organizations. Um, and we don't know what's gonna happen, but I know that we're doing really great on that regard. Um, and so we wanna make sure that, again, the specific needs and issues of trans people um, are addressed. The other um, portion of the campaign that we have, it's uh, through the private sector. We learned that um, funding that is, uh, is specifically allocated for LGBTQ issues that four cents out of every $100 are allocated for trans-led organizations and programming. And so obviously there's an, an inequity in distribution of uh, funds and support specifically to trans-led organizations and um, programming. And so we are making sure that um, we also work with uh, the private sector to ensure that there's an intentional investment in trans lives. 
And so through all of this process, uh, we have been able to, uh, you know, obviously make some adaptations in our organization. Um, we, um, we were able to have access to some money from well-intended uh, individuals and foundations, and we are currently providing some support, immediate support to, uh, to trans people. Um, so we have distributed about $50,000 in the last two months uh, to support trans people. Um, and even, you know, through the fund that the governor, uh, the governor secured to support uh, undocumented individuals, trans people who are undocumented have not been able to uh, benefit from that. Um, so we are finding ways to uh, specifically support those who are undocumented um, and who uh, obviously need the support most than everyone. Um, and so we have been able to like put shields at our cubicles for our staff. Um, you know, we have been able to build uh, a, uh, at our reception area, we put uh, glass windows. Um, we don't have our dropping space open right now, um, but we're screening people. We, we do have um, every pe person who comes into our space, we ask them to watch uh, their face, I mean, their hands first, we provide them with masks. Uh, although at the beginning of the pandemic, like many other um, essential workers, we were uh, having trouble accessing, um, you know, protective equipment. Um, and so, but now, you know, we're able to, um, to get some stuff. And so if individuals come to our organization don't have a mask, we'll provide that to them. Um, we, um, we have some hand sanitizer, um, you know, we try to, um, obviously, um, have the social distancing, uh, situation that is encouraged. Uh, so when we have our staff meetings, for instance, we do, um, you know, we do it through Zoom or whatever, uh, and people sit in like in different places, um, so, I mean, we're definitely doing our best. Um, and, you know, there's obviously a lot of adaptation that needs to happen, um, but we're definitely uh, making sure that um, we go as, uh, you know, and that we adopt obviously the, the guidelines that are required and suggested, but the truth is that we as an organization um, at this very moment are really figuring out how we can support uh, trans people uh, and their most immediate uh, and specific needs. Um, and, but yeah, and um, and I also want to say like, the, you know, we do have a transitional housing program and um, we have dedicated one room for emergency uh, service, you know, for emergency shelter. So if someone needs to be housed immediately, we put them in the room uh, with social distancing from the rest of the occupants. and um, for seven days and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll let them function as, you know, er everyone else. So we're doing a lot uh, with very little resources, but we're very grateful that we're able to support our people. Thank you. Thank you, Van B, uh, for sharing that powerful and important decision to keep your doors open and uh, just how much trust the community has in y'all, right? With many more calls y'all are getting. Um, and uh, gonna continue that energy of trying to see what people are up to. And we're gonna pass it over to Jose Joaquin uh, Molineye Rodriguez, uh, who is uh, going to be talking to us about uh, some of his work at Kauai. Uh, and so Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jose, and, and gracias. Buenos días, buenas tardes a todas, a todos y a todes. Uh, my name is Jose Joaquin Mulinelli. Uh, I'm the executive director for Kauai. I just want to share some points around what is happening in, in Puerto Rico uh, with COVID and HIV and STI. So next. So just to point out that we are an island in the Caribbean. So the only way to go to, uh, to Puerto Rico, to go and, and come to Puerto Rico is through air or through water. Next. 
So basically, Puerto Rico is more than one an island. Uh, we have uh, other islands as Vieques and Culebra, which are livable in uh, Puerto Rico, and other islands that are not livable. So there's uh, a lot of islands that uh, compose uh, are part of Puerto Rico. Next. So a little bit of history. Uh, we've been a uh, territory of the U.S. since 1898, and we want to acknowledge that we have this status uh, also with other uh, eight islands around the globe. Next. So pretty much on some notes that I want to share. We have uh, 3.6 million people living in Puerto Rico, and we have uh, some uh, main foreign populations uh, such as Dominicans and Colombians. Our main language is Spanish, and we are citizens of the U.S. Uh, by birth or adoption. And it's, this is interesting because uh, for HHA purposes, Puerto Rico is defined as a dependent area. And we are now talking about stigma, so that's 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 part of, uh, of our stigma. Uh, next, so that's the map of Puerto Rico, and we our our country is divided in seventy eight towns, including the islands of Vieques and Culebra. Next. So one of the challenges that we have been dealing with uh, since 2016 is the PROMESA law, which is a, 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 a piece of law that the Congress established to uh, uh, restructure our debt in Puerto Rico. Next. And it was, uh, it was, it was passed in June 9 of 2016, and it was signed by uh, previous President Barack Obama on June 30th, 2016. Next. So other challenges that we have been dealing previous to COVID is that we have hit by Hurricane Maria in 2017, leaving 4,645 dead uh, people counted. And uh, we have uh, had this previous in this year as a uh, summer earthquake in the south side of the island. And in March, we have uh, received COVID. And in April, we still have more earthquake. Even today has two other, we have suffered two other uh, earthquakes. And we are just started the uh, hurricane season and on November, we have the election. So we are dealing with a lot of things previous COVID and during COVID. Next, please. So just want to point out that for most of us, this is a new uh, experience working with uh, HIV and COVID, two epidemics, but uh, uh, across our existence, we have been dealing with a lot of uh, different uh, conditions that have turned into epidemic, just to share an, uh, a list of them. Next. There are at all, uh, other ones. Next. So we in COAI, we are a community-based organization established in 1991 and working with LGBT community across Puerto Rico. And we have five offices, three in the north side and one in the south and one in the west. Next. So in terms of uh, HIV cases, these are cumulative cases since we start counting cases in 1983. So HIV cases are around uh, 11,000, cumulative uh, eight cases, uh, 38,000, and uh, for a total of, of uh, uh, 50,000. It is important that we have start collecting the HIV cases in 2003. Next, please. So the STI cases in Puerto Rico, they are issued on a yearly basis by the Department of Health. And we have, we have seen an increase of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia along with HIV during the last few years. Next. So basically, those are some uh, statistics around COVID. Uh, as of yesterday, we have 4,023 uh, cases confirmed, 140 deaths. And in terms of uh, uh, breakdown by sex, 50% are women and 49% are uh, men. 
And that's the, that's the web, web page address of the dashboard in case you wanna see later. Next, please. So in terms of age, uh, pretty much the numbers uh, are in the 50 to 59 age range. And in terms of uh, health region, uh, our island is divided in uh, eight health region. Metro San Juan, which is the capital, is pretty much um, uh, the most impacted by COVID. Next, please. So we have had some limitation since the Department of Health has started the dashboard. So there are no breakdown available by sexual orientation or gender identity among other uh, uh, variables. We have had inconsistency in the number of tests, tests uh, purchased, distributed and performed by the Puerto Rico Department of Health, adjustment in cases by the, the DOH in cases reported due to duplicity. Also, uh, at some point during April, the Department of Health ceased to issue the number of tests performed and the uh, inconsistency between uh, tests performed at the airport by uh, federally qualified health centers, private laboratories, and the numbers reported by the Puerto Rico Department. Next, please. So there are other structural challenges that affect uh, why we collect the number and, uh, and uh, numbers that we have around COVID. Uh, so we have suffered, uh, um, we have had since uh, last summer, three governors in Puerto Rico, and we have had three secretary of the Department of Health, and we have had two state epidemiologists. So that's those constantly changes in positions around the uh, government uh, affect the way they are dealing with it this epidemic. Next, please. So in, on March the 13th, uh, our uh, caring governor, she declared both a curfew and a lockdown. So since that day, we have been uh, experiencing lockdowns and uh, curfew. Next, please. So that has an impact in all the activity, outside activities and, and, and in the way uh, and, and the services provider in terms of transportation, even uh, massive or individual. And most of the hotel, two, uh, uh, two or three parts of the hotels are closed. Next, please. Also the impact in the LGBT community, uh, all of the, Bars and discos are closed and uh, the commercial and survival sex work have been impacted because of the lockdown and, uh, and the curfew. Also, our main activities has been canceled or postponed. Next, please. So uh, we in Kauai, uh, we keep uh, working since day one. So we have not uh, receiving a uh, participant in our offices, but we uh, have developed safety protocol for both employees and participants. Uh, and we have turned our referrals and navigation services from active to passive, so using the phone and the emails, and de develop uh, conversatories and uh, so in a live uh, way to clarify information around COVID. Also, we have had uh, uh, distribute uh, meals that we receive as donation under the CARE Act for our participants and people from other uh, community-based organizations. Next, please. So in terms of the central government, uh, they shut down since, since March 13th. So that implies that most of the public uh, employees were sent home and pay them while staying at home. Uh, only essential services were permitted, and uh, the governor appointed a medical tax force, which was uh, developing the protocols. Uh, and it was interesting because when we start this week to reopening uh, businesses and, and, and venues, uh, the, the actual governor didn't follow the, the, uh, the, the instructions that the medical tax force gave them. Next, please. 
So these are the status of some of the um, uh, different uh, public agencies. Uh, in terms of family, uh, the services were only available online. And some of the services addressing elderly and people with functional diversity were seized. Next, please. In terms of education, the same happened. That uh, They closed the uh, school food programs and uh, the classes were only uh, online and they ceased the special education program. Next, please. In terms of the Department of the Treasury, they postponed all the taxes for July the 15th following the guidelines from the IRS also, but all the uh, other uh, appointment has to be uh, online, but there was no employees working online either. Next, please. In terms of the Labor and Human Resources Department, uh, the benefits for unemployment were only available online. And again, as Robert mentioned, uh, uh, there was a, a, a challenge for those people who, who doesn't have a, a computer, laptop, or access to the internet. Uh, next, please. In terms of the Department of Health, most of the clinics from Part B were uh, offering services in a limited days and hours. And the, 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 the governor, she signed some um, different orders in terms of uh, uh, let the pharmacies receive by email uh, medical orders and prescriptions. All the appointments were made uh, by phone and the visits also by phone instead of physical. Uh, the hospital canceled the elective uh, surgeries and uh, there was medical uh, supply uh, uh, up to uh, three months and uh, the services for of methadone and buprenorphine suspended. Next, please. So in terms of the municipality of San Juan, clinics from part A were uh, offering services in limited days and hours also and the uh, services uh, offered by the federally qualified health center were uh, offered in a limited uh, days and hours too. Next, please. In terms of mental services, they opened a, a helpline that, were, that were, uh, were attending around 1,800 calls daily and it's available uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next, please. So in terms of correctional department, this is fragmented by four different uh, administer uh, offices. So until two weeks ago, there was no protocol in place for releasing incarcerated population as risk for HIV. Those people who live in with a, a elder or living with another uh, conditions. Next please. So the next challenge is following the ending the epidemic while dealing with COVID epidemic. Next, please. And I want to thank all the frontliner workers and first responders and all the staff at, at COAI that have been doing a lot of good work during this time. Next, please. So that's our contact information and thank you. Gracias, Jose Joaquin. Thank you, Jose Joaquin, uh, for that comprehensive picture of Puerto Rico and um, for all of the work y'all are doing to, to keep the, the isla healthy and safe. Um, so we've heard from California, we've heard from uh, Puerto Rico, and now we're going to shift to hearing from community perspectives in the South. Can it to uh, Judith Montenegro. Hi everyone, so I, I wanted to share some policy and advocacy opportunities because COVID has presented a, a policy window for and Black communities that are often impacted more heavily with chronic health issues. Next slide. So some of our work began, um, if, you if you're not familiar with our program, we're a regional program of the Latino Commission on AIDS. We work from North Carolina to Texas in nine states. 
and we provide capacity building, community mobilization, and community-based participatory research. And part of the reason why our program started in the Southeast, and uh, I believe we're still the only regional programming doing this, this type of work in Latinx communities with people living with HIV, is that because between 2000 and 2010, we saw a real exponential increase in the number of Latinx population living in Southern states. Um, and, and those challenges translated to healthcare providers, health departments, municipalities, um, state governments, not having the resources available to provide services. But those challenges were also met with responses from states and local government by increasing the, the amount of anti-immigrant legislation, where anti-immigrant legislation ex is experimented with in the South, and then implemented a lot of those policies at the federal level. So we see a lot of the things federally first in the South. Um, and we also often saw that anti-immigrant legislation was that was born in some of these states was similar to the, the same politicians were introducing anti-LGBT legislation. Um, so there's a real need for intersectionality in the work that we're doing here in the South. Next slide. These next few slides I'm going to share are really about the impact of HIV in the South. Um, from these figures, you can see that 39 there was a 39% increase in Hispanic MSM for new diagnosis among men who have sex with men in the South, a 3% increase um, in Black MSM, and an 18% decrease in white MSM. Next slide. For in 2016, we also saw that 48% of all deaths among people with HIV were in the South. Next slide. And then it's important to note that the South is unique in that um, for many states, over a third of the population um, or close to it live in outside of urban areas. And so the, the idea of having rural health and healthcare in more remote settings is incredibly important, particularly now when we're facing another pandemic. Next slide. And then we can also see that PrEP in the South um, continues to be underutilized. The state level PrEP to need ratio for the region is still very low. Understanding the, the epidemic is still centered in, in the Southeast. And then we also can see that the LGBTQ population in the South is, is heavily increased in, in the South. And contrary to popular belief and, and popular culture, the South and Midwest um, have the highest proportion of LGBT populations in the US. Next slide. Um, and so I wanted to share some, some points around access to care. Next slide. For Medicaid expansion um, it is incredibly important because of the lack of Medicaid expansion, particularly in the South, it has led to hospital closures in rural areas. More people are uninsured and there's a lack of access and a lack of utilization of care. Rural areas are seeing increasing numbers of COVID infections, particularly in areas of industry like farm labor and agriculture and poultry processing plants, something that um, Bambi also shared. Both these industries really rely on Latinx and immigrant workforces. And while undocumented immigrants are not eligible for Medicaid benefits, hospital closures do have resonating impacts on individuals having already, with, that already face limitations in accessing quality healthcare, um, which includes HIV, STI, and Hep C screenings, treatment and prevention, right? COVID-19 has also increased the number of people uninsured due to unemployment. I know employer-based insurance doesn't work. Um, a pandemic, this pandemic in particular, has also made it really clear that block Medicaid grants that cap federal funding at a certain amount make states, um, making states cover anything that surpasses the amount that they've already agreed to also doesn't work. Um, because we know that a pandemic can create um, increasing amounts of need for these states and states in the South that are already um, don't have as much funds available for healthcare or don't allocate those funds would be most vulnerable. 
uh, work requirements associated with Medicaid also no longer make sense since we can see how fragile it can be for entire families to lose coverage when individuals are unemployed, um, when their insurance was tied to their employment status. Um, post COVID um, or during COVID, I guess we're still in it. States like Oklahoma that expanded Medicaid are now exploring options to go towards, to move towards block Medicaid grants in order to be able to waive eligibility, enrollment, and um, not have as much oversight. Next slide. Telemedicine, um, we've also seen as, as Jose Joaquin shared and, and Roberto that there is a need for telehealth and telemedicine. There's increased use with more flexibility for physicians. There were, there's temporary changes to how billing is structured. Um, telemedicine helps target care for uninsured um, individuals and rural communities. Um, and so COVID-19 really catapulted us into accelerating that use, um, which also means that policies for reimbursement were able to change. CMS has agreed to pay for virtual visits at the same rate as in person, um, but only while COVID emergency remains in effect. Um, CMS has also agreed to pay physicians for patient visits in certain states that take place over the phone and that providers are no longer restricted to their own states. And, and that's by state by state basis, but essentially there is sort of this reimagination of how HIV and STI testing, mail order pharmacy, how all of these instruments can be used. Um, or organizations like Medical Advocacy and Outreach in Alabama has been leading conversations about telehealth and implementing telehealth to provide HIV care and Hep C, providing medical and behavioral care. Um, however, one of the biggest obstacles to telehealth, and this is also something that some of the other presenters have shared, is the lack of broadband internet, the lack of equipment needed um, to be able to implement this with, with people who need this the most. And that's the same for the South and rural areas. All of this is to say that um, all of these things are possible without a global pandemic, right? We could have been investing in telehealth in areas that really needed um, and, and equipment for folks. Like we, we didn't have to wait for uh, a pandemic in order to make these investments. And now we know that access and accessibility can, for care can look very different, not putting communities at risk, not only for COVID, but also in many areas for ICE enforcement, right? And, and helping breaking down those barriers to care. And then finally, um, I did wanna share some things that we already know, um, that the HIV movement and epidemic has already taught us a lot of lessons prior to COVID, many of them that are being implemented now, but the importance of widespread testing and testing with good data, right? Um, there, there's a discrepancy in how data is being collected in Latin for based on race and, and ethnicity. So we don't have all the information of numbers of how many people from the Latinx community, from black communities are actually have tested positive. Um, how many folks are actually getting tested, right? All of this data is necessary in order for us to, to make the investment in, in, where, um, in where we can address HIV, STIs, and, and, and COVID now. Um, we also need to have a watchful eye around criminalization. HIV has taught us that um, during, during and after continuing to end criminalization of HIV and other STIs, um, is incredibly important because we know that it deters people from accessing the necessary prevention, treatment, and follow-up care. And we also know that we need coverage for care regardless of legal status um, for, for all of the, the STIs, uh, COVID and Hep C. Culturally and linguistically appropriate care is a priority. It needs to continue to be that way. There's been a lot of misinformation. And this is something that we've seen always around the HIV AIDS movement is that it's very easy for communities to receive misinformation. And uh, because translation is incorrect, because clinics and hospitals don't have interpretation, and all of this can be really detrimental to communities. So having that investment and making sure that information is being available to all communities is, is important. Next slide. Thank you.
that's our contact information. Thank you, Judy. Uh, and with that, uh, we can go ahead and end the slide share and begin the Q&A portion uh, for the uh, next five minutes of our time together. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask any of our four fabulous panelists, feel free to enter them in the chat or uh, unmute your mic uh, and offer it up. I'll give a few moments now um, to see if anybody has a question. I have a question, so uh, if, <laughs> I'll, but I'll wait. Just reviewing the chat now. All right. Well, while I'm sure everyone is processing um, all of the uh, information that y'all shared, uh, while folks are taking that all in, um, I was wondering if y'all could share some of the partners that y'all have turned to in this time to be able to continue to do the work that y'all are doing in each of your locations. Um, whether that's in Puerto Rico or in the South or in California, who are some of the partners that y'all have been have been turning to? Um, that's one question I have, but there is one question from the audience um, that just came in. That let's go ahead and answer that one first. Um, it's uh, for Judy, um, and this is from Adrian Juarez. Uh, it says, uh, "What do you think is the priority for researchers investigating HIV in the South?" Oh, that's tough because I think that there are so many things that we don't know about. And it's not just the South, but also regionally, right? Um, I think the South does have an increasing number of presence around um, immigration and customs enforcement, 287G counties, and there isn't a lot of research on how um, some of these smaller um, police departments and sheriff's uh, counties are, in, are using criminalization laws to um, trump up charges for, for deportation. Um, and so it is something that is very difficult to find. We've asked other partners who do more of this work to look into it, and it's incredibly difficult to track this data, find this information. Um, and, and also with the changing uh, criminalization laws um, that, that have not occurred in the South, right? We, we have new policies around U equals U. Um, all of this information just has not been disseminated into our communities um, in the South enough. Um, we've undergone a few, we've worked with a few researchers to do work around immigration and perspectives around HIV and it's still um, it's still difficult to pinpoint the amount of where a lot of the misinformation comes from and how law enforcement is using that in, in our communities. Thank you Judy. Uh, we have another question in the chat and this one is for any of the panelists. And the question is, how is the racial situation uh, in your areas, and by that they might be referring to Black Lives Matter, um, are impacting services on top of the COVID-19? Well, for us, uh, because we are open, uh, you know, from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., and with all the uh, the protests and some of those um, in, uh, looting that is happening, the, the city has established curfew. So uh, on several days, it has been that we have to close around 4.30, some of our offices, uh, because uh, the curfew would go on up to five. Some uh, areas, it's going at one, because uh, we have to close at one because the curfew starts at three, and so far. So that's how it has been uh, affected us, um, our Hollywood area where uh, one of the protests was happening, uh, we basically had to shut down that uh, that office just to make sure that our staff and uh, those clients who were coming in are safe. Uh, 
but that's how we've been affected in terms of uh, uh, the insert, uh, of the march and also uh, demonstrations. But we are more concerned is that uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, cases were still going up here in LA County, which is basically the epicenter for COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, and, and businesses and uh, services were already being open. Uh, so we were already worried about that, but now seeing some of this uh, process, uh, some that have become extremely large, uh, we're talking about more than 1,000 people, and some of them not wearing any face coverings. Uh, it preoccupies us because, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, the most affected uh, individual are people of color, you know, brown and black. Uh, so we have seen some of our clients being affected by COVID. We have seen some of our clients die because of COVID. So I think that my preoccupation is that I, while the, the demonstration continue and they're extremely or, uh, peaceful now, I believe that the curfews uh, are not going to be established today. They haven't let us know yes yet. Uh, but uh, I think that, that uh, we need to continue those demonstrations with more action. That is not something that's just now and then we forget. We need to, to continue uh, to speak to elected officials and help us and work with them to establish legislation that uh, can benefit all those uh, individuals, all the communities that have been uh, historically marginalized. Um, but uh, that's, that's separate than that. But uh, in terms Thank of uh, in terms of a demonstration, that's how it has affected us. Thank you, Rob. Um, so we are at our scheduled time. Uh, and even though we know that advocacy happens in the street and in the courtroom, I know all of y'all will continue to mobilize your communities to build the most amount of health possible for all of us together. Uh, we have a few more questions in the chat that I'll read out loud for the recording. Um, and uh, then uh, we'll... Uh, encourage uh, folks to touch base with y'all. Um, I do see that Bambi has uh, her hand up. If you if you want to share just a, a a quick a quick piece, Bambi. Um, yes. Yeah, so after yeah. after. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for you know this opportunity, and I think I what I want to say is I think it's for all of us, right? Uh, for all of us to understand. Uh, the issue of racism and how um, that has also manifested in some of the service provision that we do, specifically, uh, you know, to individuals who are of color and even to our own communities, right? So trans Latinx, Afro Latinx, um, or you know, just Afro Latinx individuals. So, um, you know, one of the things that we are definitely doing and incorporating for us is that we're going to continue to do um, anti-blackness trainings uh, for our staff and our uh, organization and um, really continue to see how we can support, you know, the leadership of trans black folks. Um, and so that's encouraged for all of us to really think about, you know, black lives um, and so, obviously, and how also we can support the leadership of Black folk. Yeah. Thank you. That's so very important. And I know I'll be following up with you to hear more about that. Um, just some of the questions um, in the chat for the recording. Uh, is there any data on HIV transmission in uh, male and female folks of transgender experience? Uh, what is one innovative strategy organizations can use to continue the ending the HIV epidemic momentum and how can the federal government support and also uh, across uh, access linguistically is a major gap right now. So what are strategies uh, your organizations have taken to educate clients uh, with uh, so called limited English proficiency on COVID-19. Uh, you, and uh, with that, uh, we're going to close out our time, continue to meditate on those questions and the presentations from today. We'll be sure to send the slides and the recording and the contact info for the speakers. I hope everyone will join me in a virtual round of applause. You can use your reaction buttons also.
Thank you all. And that's it for our session for now. Thank you, everybody. Fill out your evaluations. Be sure to send your evaluations in and to join us for uh, day three of uh, Ronium tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.